All right, let's talk about HA Kubernetes outside the cloud. Before we proceed, let's talk about uh, these uh, main players that we have um, in the next few slides that I will be presenting, right? So the first one is our etcd node. Uh, think of this big box. It could be a virtual machine. It could be a bare metal, right? It's up to you. Um, we have etcd running in there, and then all of its data is in a direct attached storage. Uh, the reason it's uh, in direct attached is because etcd is very sensitive uh, when it comes to um, disk latency. Um, you want to keep the data as close as possible to etcd to avoid any cluster instability. So direct attached storage. Uh, the other thing that we have over here is a Kubernetes node. Uh, it has uh, all of the uh, master components, right? Kube API server, Kube controller manager, and Kube scheduler. Uh, it also has what I would normally call um, a worker um, or the worker components, right? Um, others would just call it node components, but uh, it's easier for me to just call them worker components. Um, and of course, you have your pods down below. So this thing is a single um, machine. Again, could be a virtual machine, could be a physical machine, right? But a Kubernetes node contains all of these things um, in there. All right, so let's proceed. Uh, okay, before that, some jargon. I'm going to be using this kind of um, notation. So read this as three etcd by five cluster. So three represents the number of etcd nodes, and five represents the number of Kubernetes nodes. Right. The first one, a one etcd by one cluster is non-HA and non-resilient. So it's non-HA because uh, if this baby dies, uh, all of your stuff is gone, right? Your uh, pods might continue to run, you know, the app user agent might continue to access your pods, but essentially you're done, right? You can't schedule any more pods, and if any of the pods die, um, you can't, you know, it, it, do it doesn't get auto-healed because the Kube API server no longer works because it won't have access to etcd and so your controller manager and kube scheduler will also stop working at some point so if etcd dies you're done uh, if your kubernetes node dies um, you can still recover from that by firing up another kubernetes node to replace it but any data that your pod uh, was using is gone right because they were saved to direct attached storage, not not at CD, but you know on the Kubernetes node itself, uh, and because that Kubernetes node died, then took you know the data with it. So, not a very good um, setup, but for short-lived clusters or throwaway clusters, you know, like development clusters or proof of concept clusters, right? This will do. But let's move on to something more production ready. Here we have a one etcd by one cluster plus an offline backup for your uh, data Oop. plus an offline backup for your etcd data and um, an HA network attached storage that Kubernetes can talk to, right? Um, your NAS could be, you know, CephFS, CephRBD, NFS, or whatever uh, Kubernetes, the Kubernetes storage class supports, right? Uh, so this is still non-HA because if your etcd node dies, your admin won't be able to talk to the API server anymore, can't schedule any pods and so on. But it is resilient. If you bring up that etcd node from an offline backup, you know, and Kube API server talks to it again, you know, you should be good to go, right? And the same thing with your Kubernetes node. If it dies, uh, your admin and your app user won't be able to you know, do anything. But because the data is, you know, the pod data is stored in the uh, NAS, right? You just bring up a replacement node, 
have a talk to etcd and then you should be good to go right so non ha because there is going to be service disruption if any of these nodes die but it's resilient you can recover from that like okay let's move on to the next one here is a 3 etcd by 3 cluster plus the offline backup plus the ha network attached storage uh, it is HA because you know you have more than one etcd uh, node in there and you also have more than one kubernetes node if one of them dies uh, your, your you know your service to your users continue um, etcd fault tolerance is one um, and that's because uh, you know it's the design of etcd uh, which implements the uh, RAF protocol um, if you want to have a tolerance of one, you need to have three nodes there. I won't spend time talking about that. Go ahead and research etcd and raft. You know, that's, I mean, HA is hard, man. So, <laughs> uh, and, and, and that's, you know, that's the way that etcd um, solves that problem. Um, so if one of the uh, etcd nodes here dies, you're still okay because you will have two left, and they can, you know, they can they can get by. But make sure that you replace that um, dead etcd with another one because if an you know another etcd node dies, uh, your stuff is gone, right? Well, not totally gone because if you have an offline backup, you can still recover recover from it, uh, but there will be service disruption, right? Um, with your Kubernetes node, as you can see here, you have three nodes. If one of the nodes die, um, the you know the master components will just reschedule the pods and then rebind uh, the uh, storage, uh, the disk images, to the new location of your pods. Um, you will see that we've introduced a new element here at, at the top. It's an HA load balancer. Um, we need that for a number of reasons. Um, because we have three Kubernetes nodes now, uh, we will also have probably three or more than one ingress load balancer, right? For um, again, for um, resiliency um, and you know also the ability to serve. Um, uh, the the user uh, without a slowdown without a um, affecting the throughput right you have to have just enough ingress controllers to serve however number of users you have but let's just say we have more than one ingress there then we want to make sure that the ingress endpoint is stable for the uh, user um, so we'll front the uh, multiple ingresses with an endpoint here in our uh, HA load balancer, balancer and that's what the uh, app user agent will connect to. Um, it's the same thing with the uh, Kubernetes API endpoint because we will have more than one Kube API server available uh, and any one of them could go away at any time. We want to make sure that the uh, admin agent doesn't have to you know, keep track of those uh, different API server IP addresses. So we front that with a Kubernetes, a stable Kubernetes API endpoint. Um, and also, um, because we have multiple Kube API servers here, and because we have multiple etcd um, uh, nodes in our cluster, uh, we want to we want to control, or we want to we don't want to have to update the kube api server every time you know a new etcd node is brought up right we just we just want them to connect to a single api uh, and then that api or sorry we want them to connect to a single ip and that ip will you know load balance across the different etcds uh, etcd uh, nodes in the cluster right so we have three stable endpoints there um, uh, that will not you know not change whatever happens to the nodes down here. So there you, you know, that's the three etcd by three cluster, HA, fault tolerant to one, and then also resilient should, you know, you have faults more than one. Here's another one, a five etcd by N cluster. Um, I say N because 
uh, at this point, really, it's up to you how many um, uh, Kubernetes nodes you want to have. It depends on, uh, on your workload. Um, but by increasing the number of FCD nodes from three to five, you also increase uh, your fault tolerance from one to two. Again, that's the design of the RAF protocol, which is implemented by etcd. I'll leave it up to you to research or not if you're not familiar with it yet. Um, a thing to note about a 5 etcd by n is that not all nodes will be running the master components, right? You probably don't need as many API servers as there are uh, Kubernetes nodes. Uh, because that can also increase the load on your etcd cluster. Uh, five API servers connecting to the same cluster is probably not a good thing. So um, you want to limit it to you know how, whatever is the optimal um, uh, combination, right? And that's that's up to you to find out. But you know what your cluster is capable of. You know do some metering, some monitoring um, to get to the optimal uh, ratio. Um, but the uh, one other thing that's new here is uh, this part, right? There's this arrow pointing to a diamond, and that diamond leads to the Kubernetes API endpoint. Now, why is this? Why are we, or why did I design it this way instead of the kubelet just connecting, you know, to the local machine to talk to the API server? Remember that I said earlier, um, kube API server. Um, may not be present in all nodes, right? Uh, it could be just, you know, three of the end nodes are, have the, the kube API server, um, and they could move around at any given point in time, right? So your kubelet, you want to keep your kubelet, you know, you want to make your kubelet um, manageable by just letting it connect to the stable API endpoint over here, uh, and then that will take care of load balancing uh, the requests across the... Uh, um, a different API servers. So this is the five etcd by n, um, and you know the, it has way better uh, uh, fault tolerance than uh, uh, a three etcd by three or a three etcd by n for that matter. Right? It also is still resilient because of the offline backup and the HA network network attached storage. All right, let's you know bring it all together. Right. So which points in this chart? Are you comfortable with? Um, on the x-axis, we have the Kubernetes experience, less and more, right? And then on the y-axis, this is the total cost of ownership. Less over here, more over here, right? And one etcd by one has less Kubernetes experience. I mean, it has less. It gives you less of the Kubernetes experience because you know it's non non HA non resilient. Uh, if you want to add uh, offline backup and an HA network attached storage that will that will be you know that will increase your total cost of ownership because of these two additional things that you have to put into the could give you you know a little bit of improvement in the Kubernetes experience because it's still non HA right uh, service disruption at any given point in time uh, is not good if you plan to use this in a production environment and then we have the three FCD by three. 5 at CD by N, and I also put in there, you know, 7 at CD by N, and then 9 at CD by N, where, you know, depending on your needs, I suppose. Uh, I'll, I'll have you know, there, this is not based on any real data. This is just me, you know, making some guesstimates about um, what the curve is. But this, you know, basically represents what might be the case, right? Uh, the, the more... Kubernetes experience, really. The, the idea behind this is that the more Kubernetes ex HA experience you want, you know, the, the, it also has a requisite incre increase in the total cost of ownership. So you decide, you know, which points in this chart are you comfortable with. All right, so what do you think? Let's discuss. Let's talk about it. Um, if you go over here to my website, relaxdiego.com, uh, go to this post written August 26, 2017, uh, HA Kubernetes outside the cloud. Go inside there, right? And then when you click on this link down below, you'll see you, it'll lead you to uh, my website's uh, GitHub repository. 
where I prepared an HA Kubernetes discussion. Feel free to leave a comment there, you know, uh, whatever thoughts you might have, any questions, or even if you found something just totally wrong about my, um, <laughs> about my, uh, my stuff, uh, don't hesitate to uh, post in there. All right, looking forward to talking to you online.